This is Phil Koopman with a tutorial on safety and mission critical systems. Critical systems are those that must be highly dependable because the losses incurred by potential failures are unacceptable. If you are building a critical system, you could have a problem if any of the following apply. First, if you have not characterized the worst case failures for your system, then probably you're exposed to risks that you don't realize. Next, if you have not assigned safety integrity levels or the equivalent to the various hazards in your system, then you're probably not dealing with risk appropriately. Finally, if your validation plan does not match up with the actual exposure in terms of exposure hours that you will have with your deployed fleet, then you're in for some unpleasant surprises once you deploy. Critical systems require low failure rates because the cost of failure is unacceptable. The most obvious form of critical system is a safety critical system. A safety critical system is one in which loss of life or personal injury or significant environmental damage could occur if the system fails. Safety critical systems that can result in death in particular require special care to avoid adverse system failures. Some systems are mission critical, even though they don't involve direct harm to people. A mission critical system failure can result in brand tarnish, significant financial loss, or even company failure. Take, for example, Knight Capital. In 2012, this Wall Street company basically went under when a computer software configuration error led to the loss of $440 million in just a few minutes. For practical purposes, that software error killed the company. It is appropriate to consider treating a mission-critical system as though it were safety-critical to ensure an adequate level of software quality and sufficiently low failure rates. Whenever you are developing a system that controls a piece of machinery, that can affect the external environment, that can affect the flow of significant amounts of money, or can otherwise result in an expensive failure, it's important to think about what the worst case failure can be if you get the software wrong. The worst case might not be obvious without some thought. For some applications, such as an aircraft, it's pretty clear that if the flight controls don't work, you're gonna have an unacceptable loss. But for something like a household thermostat, coming up with a worst case might take some thought. You might think that the worst that can happen to a thermostat is that it gets room temperature wrong and someone has to override it. And to be sure, such failures are annoying. But there are worse things that can happen. A malfunctioning thermostat might cause extremely high utility bills if it consistently overheats or overcools the house, especially if nobody's home. Perhaps worse, a thermostat can stop working because of a software defect and result in damage to the house. For example, in January 2016, smart thermostats lost their battery power because of a software bug, and as the headline says, plunged the customers into the cold. If those customers were in a northern climate and left town to go to someplace warm in the middle of January, that failure could result in frozen pipes and potentially thousands of dollars in water damage and water bills due to flooding from broken pipes. An important exercise when you're designing your system is to ask, what's the worst that can happen? Usually, the best way to do this is to use a thought experiment and think about the following. If the designers of the system, including you yourself, modified the software to do the worst possible damage, what could happen? Now, I'm not saying that you will do this intentionally, but from a critical system point of view, a lot of ensuring your system is safe ends up being making sure an unintentional bug that happens to do that bad thing isn't really there. So this question focuses you on thinking about the hazards that could happen, whether you think they're likely to happen or not, and for the designers to make sure they mitigate every one of those hazards to make sure they cannot happen even due to an unintentional software defect. The consequences for failure can vary dramatically depending on the situation.
it is often helpful to think of them in terms of very wide bins, such as whether they result in multiple fatalities, a single fatality, severe injuries, or minor injuries. Typically, anything involving a fatality is treated with significantly more engineering rigor than something that results just in injuries. For mission-critical systems, one can consider a parallel set of bins, but instead of injuries or fatalities, those bins range from entire corporation failure down to a very minor financial loss. The general strategy for building critical systems is to first define a safety integrity level, or SIL, that is required, and then use that SIL to guide the system design process. In practice, a SIL represents three related things. First, it represents the risk presented by a system level hazard, with a high SIL being considered extremely hazardous and a low SIL considered minimally hazardous. Second, a SIL is used to define the amount of engineering rigor and system cost that is applied to mitigate that risk. Third, a SIL is associated with an acceptable target for the residual probability of system failure after mitigation has been completed. One example of how this concept can be applied is DO-178, which is the safety standard for commercial aviation. DO-178 associates risk with accumulated aviation flight hours. It uses design assurance levels, or DALs, but for our purposes, let's say it's the same as a SIL. At the highest level, DAL A is associated with a catastrophic event, such as the loss of an entire aircraft. This actually happened in 2015, when an Airbus 400M military cargo plane crashed due to a software configuration error. DO-178 and its associated guidance documents permit catastrophic events to happen only once in every 10 to the 9th flight hours which is 1 billion hours, or about 114,000 years of aircraft flight operation. According to an FAA guidance document, this amounts to saying that a catastrophic event should never happen even once to any aircraft in an entire fleet of aircraft of a particular type. DAL B, which is a hazardous event, is permitted to happen 100 times more frequently, or about every 1,100 years. Major and minor incidents are again allowed to happen with multiples of 100 times more frequently each. The context for major and minor events is that a trained flight crew is available and is very likely to recover from or minimize any impact to humans when these type of events happen. A different example is the IEC 61508 Functional Safety Standard, which is used by the chemical process industry and for other industrial control applications. The consequences of an extreme failure of these systems can involve thousands of deaths, as happened in 1984 at Bhopal, India, with a toxic chemical gas release. It should be noted that IEC 61508 was not in existence at the time of Bhopal, but hopefully this standard has served to mitigate the risk of such catastrophic events as computer controls have become pervasive in that industry. IEC 61508 has four SILs defined, with SIL 4 allocated a permissible failure budget of once every 11,000 years. It should be noted that the exposure and operational scenarios for this standard are a bit different than aircraft, which explains the slightly different number. One significant difference is that a chemical processing plant can usually be shut down to be made safe, whereas an aircraft has to keep flying potentially for several hours to a diversion airport after a failure. The SILs in IEC 61508 have a factor of 10 difference in permissible failure rates. With SIL 1, failures are only permitted once every 11 years. Other industries have their own safety standards, which have varying permissible failure rates, but they generally follow the idea that risk determines a permissible failure rate at that particular SIL, and life-critical failures tend to be targeted at tens or hundreds of millions of hours 
or even billions of hours between adverse events. Once a SIL has been determined, that SIL is used to guide the level of engineering rigor applied in designing the system. An example can be found in the engineering technique tables of IEC 61508. Techniques that must be used for a SIL are said to be highly recommended, which means they must be used unless there is a truly compelling argument that they are simply not applicable. Other techniques are said to be recommended. That means they're a good idea and should be done to the degree practical, but are not strictly required for 100% of the project, as long as the result is still of acceptable quality. Additionally, some techniques are said to be not recommended, which means that they are prohibited when building systems. As mentioned on the previous slide, for this safety standard, SIL-1 is the lowest integrity level and presents low risk. Generally speaking, SIL-1 systems require a reasonable level of engineering rigor, but not a lot of special techniques for safety. On the other hand, at SIL-4, a significant number of specialized techniques are required to not only achieve safety in practice, but also so that everyone can know that the safety has actually been built into the system. This example table is extracted from one of many pages of such tables in the safety standard. You can see that for SIL-1, a number of techniques are recommended. Only one technique is highly recommended, which is using structured methods for writing the code. At SIL-2, there may be significant injuries, but no one is expected to die from this type of failure, so more techniques are recommended, but there are no additional highly recommended techniques. It is interesting to see that the use of artificial intelligence for fault correction and dynamic reconfiguration are forbidden starting at SIL-2. That's mostly because the system that is tested with these techniques is not going to match what the system in the field actually does due to the reconfiguration. At SIL-3, people can die due to a system failure, and a significant number of additional techniques become highly recommended at that SIL. At SIL-4, the consequences can be even worse, and many more techniques become highly recommended, which again means that you basically have to do them. It is common in safety standards to see this type of significant difference when the line is crossed between a SIL-2 injury type category and a SIL-3 fatality type category. The idea behind this graphic is that as SIL increases, more engineering rigor is applied and not just applied in general, but applied according to a preset list of defined activities that are contained in the appropriate safety standard for your domain. Thus, determining a SIL for a particular hazard directly determines what construction techniques, analysis techniques, hardware redundancy structures, and other approaches must be used to ensure an adequate level of safety. An important context for designing critical systems is understanding the fleet exposure and probability of a loss event or mishap. In general, bigger fleets of deployed systems have a higher level of exposure to hazards. Let's take an example of the US vehicle fleet, which is about 250 million vehicles, with each vehicle operated about one hour per day. That gives 250 million hours of exposure every single day to adverse events. Intuitively, many people think that if something happens once every million hours, it's an unlikely event. And that makes sense in everyday life because a human lifespan is less than a million hours. So something that happens once every million hours can be considered a once in a lifetime event if it even happens at all. However, if you're producing millions of products, it's not what happens to one product that matters, but what happens to the entire fleet of products that's exposed. For the fleet of US vehicles, a failure that happens once every million hours of operation will by simple math be happening about 250 times every single day across the operational fleet. So what's unlikely for an individual can be near certainty for a fleet of deployed systems.
This is why a permissible failure rate of once every million hours is generally not acceptable for a catastrophic mishap. It is common to see much more stringent goals. The chemical process industry uses every 100 million hours for a catastrophic event. In aviation, it's every billion hours. And in rail, it's every 10 billion hours. It is important to recognize that individual hardware components tend to fail every 100,000 hours or every million hours. This is comparable to the non-fatal permissible failure rates, but is much more frequent than is permissible for life-critical failures. The only way to deal with this reality is to use independent components so that the failure of an individual component does not make the system unsafe. This means that any life-critical application, so generally speaking, SIL 3 or 4, must have redundant components that fail independently and result in bringing the system to a safe state regardless of what single component within the system fails. If you have a mission-critical system and are not required to follow a safety standard, the way to look at this math is the following. Determine the fleet exposure you expect, which is simply the number of units you're going to build times the number of hours that an average unit will operate. Next, determine the number of acceptable failures at a particular level of severity. You can compute the acceptable failure rate simply by dividing the number of failures by the number of hours. Then, use that number to look up in a reasonable safety standard what the SIL should be to achieve about that level of failure rates. So, for example, if you'd like your system to fail less often than every 10 million hours, you might decide to adopt IEC 61508 SIL 3, not because you're life critical, but rather because that standard is intended to give a residual failure rate of about 10 to the seventh hours, which is your target number. The best practices for building critical systems revolve around characterizing the various worst case failure scenarios. In particular, you need to mitigate the absolute worst case scenarios that could possibly happen whether or not you intuitively deem them to be likely. Each scenario should be assigned a SIL according to a relevant safety standard. You should then use engineering rigor appropriate for that SIL for software and use appropriate hardware redundancy as well. Finally, you should consider fleet exposure in terms of number of failures that will happen across the entire fleet at a particular severity, rather than whether any one unit will fail or not. This will ensure that you have followed a methodical approach to minimizing risk rather than going by the seat of your pants. There are several big pitfalls in building critical systems. The first is that software redundancy is a very difficult topic because independent failures require diverse software and measuring or even attempting to get diversity in software is challenging at best. In practice, diverse software is not something you can get perfect. The general solution to this is simply to look at the highest SIL allocated to a component and write all the software for that component according to the requirements of that SIL so it is effectively perfect for the level of SIL required. The next big pitfall is that designer's intuition about what faults might be realistic is almost always hopelessly optimistic and in general, not to be trusted. That's because even the smartest, most experienced engineer is going to be less than a million hours old, so they will not have personal insight and experience with failures that happen every 10 million or 100 million hours. It's a real struggle to imagine such things, let alone use the intuition to decide which things are really going to happen or not. Catastrophic events happen to individual systems so infrequently that it's likely that no one in the team has seen or heard of that type of event, much less experienced it in person. However, these are exactly the types of events that do cause catastrophic failures in the real world. One way to help mitigate this lack of personal experience with catastrophes is to consider what will happen if 
in a malicious case. So you assume a malicious adversary is trying to make your system fail. Ask what the worst they could do is and say, okay, that could also happen by chance at one per billion hours, so we have to mitigate it. This approach avoids the natural tendency to dismiss hazards that designers don't have personal experience with. Finally, a strong safety culture is an important asset to creating critical systems. Going through the motions is not enough. Even if you're using a SIL-based process, safety first has to be more than a slogan and must permeate the culture of any organization designing safety critical systems. History shows us that most, if not all, catastrophic system failures happen because of a broken safety culture and not because of simple operator error or technical mistakes made along the way.